a little bit after nine o'clock. We'll get our members here and seated and we will get started. I think this morning's business, um, we are going to have a hearing on HB 2518. Um, Jason, would you mind reviewing that for the committee, please? That's probably a good idea. Jason, before we start on the hearing, um, there's been a couple of questions about what bills that we had available to us in committee. Would you mind giving us a brief rundown of that and... That way the committee can think about those or give some thought to those going forward. Sure. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, you should have in your packets today a uh, memo that was drafted by KLRD uh, summarizing the legislation that went through this committee um, last session in 2021. Um, the first two bills, 2034 and 2035, are still in the committee. Uh, the contents of those bills were, however, moved into other bills, one of which was stricken from the House calendar later during the session. Uh, and then 2035 was put into 2175. This is the Dwayne Peasley Technical Training Center District Act. Um, that is currently sitting on the Senate calendar over on the other chamber uh, awaiting action. Um, House Bill 2100 um, was placed into another bill as well, um, and that was signed by the governor. So the contents of 2100 are essentially uh, open um, if the committee would like to put something into that bill. Uh, as I mentioned, 2175 is on the Senate calendar. 2176 and 2177 were both also included in other bills um, that were enacted last session. So both of those bills are essentially shells in this committee. Uh, 2178 was signed into law. That one's out. So you do have, uh, in terms of subject matter that hasn't gone anywhere else and is still in this committee, you have 2205 on publication of legal notices um, on designated websites by local municipalities. You have 2232 on uh, petitions for proposed ordinances. And you have 2233, which is the Municipal Historic Buildings Act. Those three bills are still in this committee and their contents have not appeared anywhere else um, in the past year. In terms of Senate bills, uh, you have, I think all three Senate bills have um, been moved. Senate Bill 52 was approved by the governor. Senate Bill 53 is still sitting on the House calendar. Um, it moved out of this committee. And Senate Bill 118 was approved um, by the governor last year. So all three of those have moved out of the committee. Um, and that, uh, and then of course you have the two bills that have been referred to this committee this session. Committee, I'm I apologize. That was supposed to be in, in your list there, and I did not get it in there, and I'm sorry. I will send you an email with attachment that has all the information that uh, Jason, and I'll do that right after the, right after the committee meeting. Uh, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Okay, committee, any discussion on any of those previous bills? Sounds like all of our housekeeping is pretty well done. Um, I think then we will go ahead and move on to opening the hearing on HB 2518. And Jason, if you please review that bill for us, we would appreciate it. Sure, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, House Bill 2518 uh, amends provisions in the Municipal General Improvement and Assessment Laws. Um, these amendments generally deal with notice to the uh, owner of record of property that is affected by uh, an improvement um, district and the uh, special assessments that are levied um, for those improvements. Uh, first, the bill amends 12-6A04. Uh, this is the statute that requires a public hearing by the uh, municipality on the advisability of the improvement district. Um, the bill would require that notice of that hearing be mailed by first class mail to all owners of record of property that is proposed to be included in the district. So there is a definite mailing notice of that hearing uh, to those property owners. Second, the bill amends 12-6A06, um, and this is a statute that requires publication of the resolution that adopts the improvement district 
in order for it to be effective. Uh, 2518 adds to that requirement that not only do they have to publish, but they would also have to mail notice of the adoption of the resolution they, uh, by first class mail to the owners of record of the property in the improvement district before that resolution can become effective. So clear notice to the property owners there. And then finally, uh, the bill uh, amends 12-6820. Uh, the current law requires that either prior to the execution of a real estate contract or as, or as part of the contract, the seller must disclose that the property is subject to a special improvement district assessment. Uh, 2518 amends that provision to require um, that the disclosure be a part of the real estate contract as well as disclosed prior to. So you have to disclose it in negotiations and include that uh, disclosure in the real estate contract uh, that the property is subject to the special improvement district assessments. Uh, the bill will go into effect on July 1st of this year if it's enacted, and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Representative Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what exactly is the definition of an improvement district? Uh, these are districts where if there's special infrastructure, uh, it's my understanding, infrastructure improvements needed uh, within just that confined area that's outlined in the district, uh, then a special levy is assessed by the municipality on the property owners within that district to pay for those infrastructure improvements. So would that be like the addition of fire hydrants, for example, or... Yes, or, or, or say you're replacing 100-year-old water lines throughout the district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Curtis. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, can a benefit district be established and then it's like years down the road before there's actually any assessment? And then my second question to that would be, if that is the case in between that time, is there any opportunity for like the public or the people who will be impacted to weigh in on any of that? Well, uh, I'd have to double check as to what statutory requirements there would be to begin work on the improvements after the improvement district is authorized. Um, but there is a whole hearing process and public meeting process and adoption of a public resolution to create the district. And there's public uh, input through that process. And then there's process to, I believe, dissolve the district as well. Um, but I'll have to get back to you as to when any work has to start after the district has been created. There's any bay mix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Jason, the, when the district is established, the first thing that has to happen as part of that hearing is there has to be shown uh, benefit to the properties that are going to be affected. And that's, that's a process that has to be gone through. One of the problems that, you know, that we have, and I think this may be something that in the resolution that is passed, uh, uh, generally there's a date that on or before uh, such and such a date that the work will be done. So that's generally established. But one of the problems that, that we get into is a situation where people will, where a developer will come in and will sign an agreement not to protest the benefit district. That may, that may be a very similar situation. So I think that that's one of the things that you know, it's important to me, I guess, what that notification is, you know, at, whenever it happens. So that is, then there is that lag time. But not to okay. Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jason, can you go through this with me a little bit about, does this eliminate the process to petition to form a district? Uh, the, the bill does nothing in terms of eliminating any of the existing um, processes um, 
or establish an improvement district. It only adds some additional notification requirements. All right, thank you. Committee, anything further? Okay, Jason, thank you. Very good overview for us. All right, committee, I think the first thing we'll do is start with proponent testimony. And the first proponent testimony that we have is Ann Boo Rongish. I hope that's relatively close. And I think she's going to appear via WebEx. Are you available? Yes, I'm here. Good. We can hear you fine. All right. Um, good morning, Chairman and committee members. My name is Ann Rongish. Um, I'd like to thank you. Um, for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning about House Bill 2518. Every day, people can make decisions. Some of these decisions are really important life decisions, like whether or not um, you're a K-State or a KU fan, um, but some of them are really just more simple. Um, at the grocery store, you have the freedom to choose from varieties of bread, and at the end of the day, a loaf of bread is chosen and you purchase that at a particular price. Now imagine coming home and um, the manager from the store calls you and says, ma'am, you know that bread you bought earlier is actually $50 more than what you bought it for and you're going to have to come back and pay for it. Does that sound ridiculous? Yes, it does. But in reality, your constituents are dealing with something really similar when purchasing homes. Um, I bought my first home in 2018 in Northwest Olathe. It was a brand new build, so I was able to make decisions on colors, appliances, designs, you name it, I got to choose it. So imagine my shock when I received a letter in the mail um, that I was going to be taxed almost $14,000 for something that wasn't my decision. The tax was for a benefit district that was approved in 2008, yes, 2008, and it was never disclosed to me in my contract. This benefit district is to build a road at least a quarter a mile away from my house, and I will never be using that road. Um, the road will be built in a current empty field um, so that the developer can, can continue to build more houses for profit. Kansas State Statute 12-6A20 states that the seller of the property shall disclose to the buyer that the property is subject to special assessment. I can tell you that neither myself nor a large number of my neighbors were notified of any assessments upon contract signing. What's really interesting is that homeowners questioning the lack of notification have been insulted. Um, they are told at, that as a consumer, we have to understand the risks and costs involved in making purchases. Do we have to also assume any extra caution when going to buy bread? We are also insulted saying that we were neglectful in understanding or reading our home contracts in its entirety. I'm happy to supply my full contract that does not disclose any benefit districts, and I'm sure my fellow neighbors would be happy to do the same. We were also insulted that we can't read signs. A sign for the 2008 benefit district stood hidden about half a mile away um, down a dangerous two lane road. For anyone that had the luck of reading that sign, it said that it was a benefit district that would be paid for by the developer. Now, um, it wasn't until late last year that uh, new signs were updated and placed in visible and safe locations. So my question is, what about future homeowners? There is development north of me that will subject new homeowners with two benefit districts. There is zero signage and no disclosures. These assessments per homeowner are ranging from forty to $65,000 for these benefit districts. This is egregious considering the average income in Kansas is about $32,000. In fact, even at $14,000, my husband and I do not, do not have that readily available, and we are having to delay starting a family so that we can manage these extra assessments that have really blindsided our lives. These are just some of the reasons we need House Bill 2518. Your constituents need protection on perhaps the biggest financial decision of their lives. The act of full disclosure will not hurt any party in a financial transaction. 
It gives people the freedom to decide what's best for them. And while I think the use of benefit districts to help private for-profit developers is unnecessary and controversial, I think that um, I believe we can at least agree that homeowners should be given notice of the benefit districts so they can make appropriate decisions to purchase a home. Future homeowners can have the safety and security knowing that they are making an informed decision. This is why I'm asking for your support for House Bill 2518. Thank you for your time and support. Thank you for your testimony. Committee, any questions of the, of the conferee? Representative Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So did you have any recourse whatsoever to, to fight this? No, we did not have any, um, any recourse. Um, the city approved it in 2019. It, they re-approved it. Um, basically by adding a couple hundred square feet, but my our property is still in it. Um, it has been funded and construction has already started, so we have no say whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any, any further questions? Great. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, committee, moving on, we have Denise Holm, and she also is, I assume she is appearing via WebEx. Are you available, Ms. Holm? Good morning, can you hear me? We can now. You are Yay. in the committee. Welcome to the committee. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Thompson and committee members. My name is Denise Holm, and I live in Olathe in a community called Cedar Creek. I am a proponent of House Bill 2518. Home buyers and homeowners in my community are victims of benefit districts that are not being used in the manner they were designed for. I believe that benefit districts were designed to assist the developers with go bond financing, but was never intended for homeowners to pay 49% of these projects. The city of Olathe is using the pretense that growth pays for growth, but are allowing developers to build new infrastructure for city and developers use on unsuspecting uninformed homeowners. The city has not protected its taxpayers from this practice. And in fact, it has assisted the developers. All of the other cities in my county exclude the homeowners from any benefit district, if used at all. I'm a retiree and have bought and sold many homes and I have never heard of benefit districts. I've paid numerous special tax assessments for upgrading current sewer and water lines before, but never for brand new water lines and major arterial roads to benefit a future neighborhood. These expenses should be paid by a developer and city investment. I believe that cities should have stricter guidelines to follow so they are not changing policies and resurrecting 12-year-old benefit districts like what is happening in Olathe. The city and developers are carving out districts and when the developer sells off close to 49%, they activate them so the developers maintain the majority to approve. I would like to see stricter real estate disclosure on these benefit districts so homeowners can make an educated purchase. The assessment wasn't even on the listing where the annual property tax is shown. I recommended to the city of Olathe that a separate sheet be used disclosing the district and approximate estimate and to be given to each potential buyer. I don't know how mortgage companies can actually pre-qualify these properties that will have an additional $70 per month for 20 years as an assessment that isn't disclosed. If I knew that my lot was being assessed $14,300 for an $11 million parkway I would never use, I would have been able to adequately compare it to the same size lot in neighboring Lenexa. I would have been able to make an informed decision. Thank you for your time and consideration on this bill. 
Thank you for your testimony. Committee, any any questions? Representative Sanders. So just so I understand, is it your testimony that your lender didn't even know about this? When they uh, no, your actually, loan? actually, I didn't have a lender. We're retired and we were fortunate enough to be able to pay cash for our home. But my neighbors that all had mortgages, when you pre-qualify, uh, the special assessment, the benefit district tax was not available nor disclosed to be calculated into whether they could pre-qualify. I'm concerned about the new families that are in by the skin of their teeth and what $70 a month for 20 years would do to them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Blux. So you didn't have, I'm sorry. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so that I'm understanding this correctly, uh, in your experience with this, how long are uh, homeowners in that benefit district paying for something that they're not even getting? Is there, you know, in other words, you may pay on something for 10 years and not see any anything what you're paying for. Am I understanding you correctly? Um, no, we will actually be assessed as soon as the parkway is completed and the developer receives the go bond money uh, as a reinvest reinvestment reimbursement. And at that time, we are assessed. So therefore, when I did a search through my on property tax, I had nothing on my property because it is not assessed and does not show up until the benefit district is paid and the property is actually assessed. Thank you. Does, for that. does that make sense? That that didn't come yeah. out very clear. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Representative Helmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was part of my question. And did any of your neighbors or you have an appraisal to where the appraisal would have maybe shown some of that, that benefit tax showing up, uh, an appraisal for the mortgage? I know you didn't have a mortgage. Right. Usually On a mortgage company call calls for an appraisal. Right. And I, my house was appraised and it did not show up there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Amix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Holm, uh, did you receive yes. a title insurance policy at the time of your closing on your property? Yes, I did. And that is where this whole thing got confusing was I was one of the fortunate ones that it did show a 2008 uh, benefit district for road improvement. And I did see that on my closing policy. Now, mind you, this is during COVID and our house had sold and my house hasn't finished yet. So we had been over 30 days in an Airbnb. We walked into closing and I did see that on the closing report. And I thought, geez, you know, that's that's so long ago, 2008. I mean, we're talking 12 years. Surely that road's been built. Well, my fault. I was wrong. So my closing company actually did find it. But how the city and the uh, developer created, resurrected this benefit district to build this road a quarter of a mile from my house that is on the west side when all of the services are on the east side, I will never use that. So how they call it a benefit district is beyond me. I mean, I've, I've heard of special tax assessments, and that's what you were talking about earlier, I believe, about as far as, you know, when a sewer line breaks and a community has to get together and pay for that sewer line that they are using uh, to be repaired. I understand that, and I would not have any problem at all paying for that. I would not have any problem paying for a new water line that had broke. But pay, I'm paying for a water line that will go into a new plat 
And the only way that this developer can access that plat is to put this new parkway in that is a dead end road and everyone in the community laughs and calls it the road to nowhere. But I'm paying for someone else's water line because I already have water. And I'm paying for a parkway that I'll never use because it's on the wrong side of my house. That's what does not make sense on this. This is not a special tax assessment that we're all used to paying to rejuvenate and repair services that we need as an infrastructure. This is a benefit district, which is all totally different. I'm not sure who it benefits other than the developer to open new plats and the city to not have to pay for a parkway. I'm sorry, I kind Perhaps of got anybody, off. No, nope. thank you. Um, the only reason that I bring that up is that personally, anybody is giving merchantable title to their property through that title policy. Those things are yes. generally going to be listed somewhere in that policy. The problem with it is, is you go in and you buy a house, then you're given a stack of papers too many people that take the time to go through that title policy you know and find that on page 13 so that's the only reason that i bring that thank you thank you mr chair representative featherston thank you mr chair um miss holm i know when i bought my house 20 years ago i was already under contract but not to closing when i was told my roof would need to be replaced and with a husband as a student and my modest piano teacher income that was a shock but we felt trapped because we couldn't get out of our contract without penalty. So our lease was expiring on our rental. We would essentially be rendered homeless if we didn't continue on with our house. Um, did you experience something similar to that at closing that, I mean, did you feel like you could get out of your house at that point without penalty? No, I, I didn't really consider what the penalties would be. Um, I, like you, was trapped. I had been in an Airbnb for 30 days, and which was not, not a pleasant experience. And my, my home of 15 years had been sold and was already occupied. Um, and the thing is, is that on my title policy, it just... It, it listed a t benefit district from 2008 for road development. I believe that's how it read. And that did not mean that it had been enacted. Uh, it could still be sitting there vacant. There was nothing, no red flag. And yes, I, I guess I could have not signed the closing papers at that time and tried to find another place to live. We'd gone through the building process with COVID that had been put off and put off. We were already over 90 days past our closing date. Um, I was not notified that, that I was currently being assessed or that it was $14,300. Uh, you know, my fault. I'm 65 years old. I should know better. I bought and sold a lot of houses. But to think that a road that had not been built and assessed in 12 years was active, I think that that's a little bit of a stretch. Representative Butts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, do you feel that there's a, a property devaluation uh, because of this assessment and now that you're aware of it, uh, assuming you would disclose it, uh, how does that affect, in your opinion, the market value of the house you just bought? I would think that it devalues the property because of the amount of tax that will be assessed on it. I believe uh, they should be complete with the road in August. So I will have a, an additional $14,300 assessed. And that, that number isn't firm yet. It was an $11 million road, and my neighbors and I have been fighting this for over a year. Um, so far, we've had over a half a million dollars worth of 
questionable landscaping that was added in that has since been removed. Um, it's basically we are being taken advantage of. Benefit districts are not being used this way anywhere in the state of Kansas except in Cedar Creek. And it seems to be something that uh, these developers have capitalized on and they get their major in infrastructure paid 49% by the citizens after they sell us a house. Thank you. Mr. Roth, thank you very much for your testimony. It's very powerful and, and very sadly true. Um, hopefully the wisdom of the committee will be able to come up with some kind of a solution to help uh, your situation and folks in the same situation as you. So we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. And I, I do think that it's important that the city of Olathe, they did pass a new policy that 100% of the homeowners had to agree. But these policies, they tend to change every year or two. So I, I feel like my new neighbors will be protected for one year, but they still have four more, four to five, I believe, benefit districts waiting in the wings for the newest plats. And so these new neighbors are going to come in and they're going to end up doing the exact same thing to them. And that's what I don't want to see happen. I want to see a disclosure statement that, you know, if you're looking at this lot, it's also going to have a $14,000 benefit district assessed on it. And it doesn't have to do with the value of the house. They're charging us by square foot of the lot. So the larger the lot, the more you pay. And there's no exaggeration. Okay. We had we had some that were in the sixty to eighty thousand dollar range because of the size of their lot. But that's that's what I'm asking you for. I'm stuck right now. I'm asking you to protect the future homeowners in Cedar Creek from this practice that's going on and give the city some guidelines so that they can't be I don't I don't want to say manipulated, but I don't, I don't want them used or put in a bad situation where they can't protect their taxpayers. Okay. Again, thank you very much for your testimony. We appreciate you thank being you. here this morning. Thank you. You're welcome. Committee, moving on, we will now look to Nicholas Payne, who is signed up as a proponent. I think he's appearing via WebEx also. Mr. Payne, are you with us this morning? Good morning, Honorary uh, Chairman Thompson and committee thank members. You. Can, you, can you hear me? Yes, welcome to committee. Okay. I want to thank you for allowing me to testify here today. <clears throat> My name is Nick Payne. I live in Northwest Olathe. I live in Cedar Creek. Cedar Creek is probably one of the top 10 upscale subdivisions in all of Johnson County, possibly in all of Kansas. Um, most of the homes, you know, range anywhere from 450000 and they go all the way up to probably two or $3 million. Uh, it's a large community. It's got over 1,600 homes, um, and it's complex. And uh, we actually have some issues with the HOA, and we may be coming back to visit the state house <laughs> about those issues. But that's a, that's a different story in a different time and a different day. Uh, most of the people that live out here are professionals. They're doctors, lawyers. Um, they're business owners. Um, they were all kind of surprised what happened here last April. And um, something kind of really kind of astonished quite a lot of them. And I'm going to give you a couple stories about that. I was at the uh, Latha City Council last May, on May 4th, uh, in, in evening time. And it was crowded, even though COVID was uh, pretty rampant at that point. And um, I listened to the testimony of a couple of homeowners, and I thought, wow, this is unbelievable. Um, and the first testimony was, uh, or one of the testimonies was from a man. He said he'd uh, been driving home uh, from his job, traveled down Collins Boulevard going uh, west, entered into his subdivision. His subdivision actually is called Prairie Brook, and that's just uh, directly east of Cedar Creek. And uh, he said he got home, got out of his car, went to his mailbox, opened the mail, and uh, Pulled out a letter from the city of Olathe, and it said, uh, information, uh, notice of information, please, please read. So uh, it was a nice sunny day. He was walking back inside. He opened up the letter, and, and 
he was just floored, he said. Uh, and he had four children, he said, and he talked about having uh, done a lot of uh, work uh, to save for his kid's college. And he lives on a kind of a fixed budget. And he said uh, he was floored because he was told in this letter that he was going to have to pay over $20,000 for an assessment to build a road that he would never use. And um, because the, the, the roads, the way they were built and designed in this proposal, he just flat out wouldn't be using them. He, he kind of goes in and out of his subdivision and, and just goes down College Boulevard. He doesn't use those other roads. And so he, he talked to his wife about it and they both were angry. And he just so happens he was uh, these uh, HOA president and he got all the people rallied in his uh, subdivision to oppose it. And they wrote over 300 emails to the city council. They uh, hired an attorney and uh, they fought and they fought like, you know what? <laughs> so anyways, that's one story I heard that night. The other story I heard was from a guy uh, a senior citizen. He lived in the same subdivision, Prairie Brook. He lived in a villa, and they do have villas there. And um, he said, well, I live on a fixed income, and I got this thing in the mail that said I was going to have to pay twenty dollars to $25,000 for, for my home, you know, about $1,000 a year. He said, I don't have the money for that. And that's what he told city council. Well, city council, in its infinite wisdom that night, Almost voted on it, but there was one guy, his name was Larry Campbell. He was a city councilman, and he said, this isn't right. Let's hold up and let's talk about this, and let's put this on, uh, on the back burner, and let's get some input from, other, from the citizens, and let's see what we can do to try to figure out um, what we need to do about this mess. And that's, that's kind of what he referred to it. He called it a mess because they had gotten tons of public input, and, pu and people calling, people being angry. Um, and then one, one other last story, there was another guy, and his name is Jeff uh, Geldner, ex-KU basketball player, lives in Cedar Creek where I live. And he lives in kind of the, uh, Cedar Creek actually has 21 neighborhoods of all things. And he lives in kind of one of the richer uh, homes and he's a business owner. And he said uh, he got one too. And he, he just was angry. <laughs> I mean, just really angry because he'd already been living in his home for three years. And these other people had already been living in their homes for years. And they were like, what is this? I mean, wh what's up with this? I mean, we live in a home and we're being told we have to build a road that we don't want and we don't need and we won't use. And they were like, this is, this is appalling that the state would allow this to potentially occur and that they allow some type of loophole for a developer to come in and ask citizens who've already lived in their homes for years to build a road for a developer and roads that they wouldn't even use. So Jeff got together and, and uh, he got with his neighbors and they went and hired an attorney. So there was two attorneys fighting with the city, uh, kind of, kind of, I guess you could say fighting with the developer and, um, and the city did back down. Now, it took thousands of dollars of attorney fees, thousands, probably thousands of hours of collective time of, of these people. And they wrote letters to you all. They wrote letters to the uh, LA, the city council. And uh, I'm, I'm talking thousands of, of hours. People met, they talked, they, um, they fretted, and they were angry. And this was over 300 homeowners. And uh, so the city did back down. The developer, they must have talked to the developer because the developer did end up withdrawing his proposal. And then at the next uh, city council meeting, they went ahead and approved a new benefit district for him, but it was only for his land that he hadn't yet developed. And I thought, and I was at that hearing that day and. I testified and I, you know, I thought about all that. And I thought to myself, hmm, what's going to happen to all these people that moved in to this new area, this new land area? And they don't know about it because there's really no signs up. 
And they start buying these homes, and eventually, someday, the developer goes back to the city council and he says, hey, I want to uh, get this uh, benefit district implemented now. They're all going to be caught off guard. It's not going to be in their title, I doubt it. And it probably wasn't in the real estate contract, and it wasn't told to them by their real estate agent. Because the real estate agent, when he got together with the seller's agent over there at Cedar Creek Realty, they didn't say much about it. So that's the reason why last summer I got involved and I developed a Facebook committee. And we have over 551 uh, people on our Facebook page called Stop Benefit Districts in Lake of Kansas and more. Because we kind of found out that there's a lot of problems uh, with developers, at least in our area, Cedar Creek. And so, you know, that's uh, kind of how I got involved. I, I wasn't even one of the 300 that was going to get taxed, if you can believe that. Uh, but what I, what I did find out in my research is that I found out that um, my house, 25 years old, was subject to the next benefit district. Now, I have a 25-year-old home. It's worth probably $550,000, and it's 25 years old. I'm having to put a lot of upkeep into it. I mean, I've had to do roof work. I've had to do air conditioning and heating. I mean, it all adds up. And I'm sitting there thinking, why in the world would the state want somebody like me to have to consider being – to pay for a tax for a road for a developer for a road that I wouldn't use, um, why would that why would that be in the state's interest? So I did send you all a, a kind of a write up of my concerns here, and I would ask that one of you develop the courage to amend this bill. And the bill really needs to say you're going to eliminate benefit districts for roads. In Kansas, all of Kansas, because, you know, we pay a lot of taxes here in Kansas. Uh, Kansas, from what I understand, is the 11th most taxed state in the, in the nation. And, you know, when you when you throw that benefit district tax on top of it, all of a sudden Kansas becomes about eight or nine. Because that's a thousand dollars a year extra for a person, maybe a household income of only 80,000. That's that's like an extra one percent. So, so yeah, I, I need somebody that's going to be courageous, someone that's going to say, hey, this nonsense has got to stop. It's got to be uh, really, it, it can't just be about notification. It can't just be about signs. It's got to be about stopping this tax grab. That's what it's really got to be about. And it's also got to be about what I call the triple tax, stopping the triple tax. The triple tax and, you know, uh, is basically property tax I pay. I pay property tax. I pay sales tax, but I should have to pay a third tax here locally? That's, uh, that's not right. The other thing I wrote about in my, in my little testimony here is it's also taxation without representation. And, uh, and I say that because those people got two weeks to prepare for that uh, hearing back in May 4th on May 4th, and uh, they barely had enough time to even get an attorney. So, and I think we fought to prevent that from happening back in the 1700s. So that's all I really got to say here today. I mean, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Okay, Mr. Bain, thank you for your testimony. Uh, committee, any, any questions? I think you must have done a thorough job. We appreciate your testimony this morning. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Committee, I will point out to you, um, and I know Gary had sent you an email, or the committee assistant had sent you an email with written-only testimony as proponents um, from several folks. The most all of them are from the Olathe area. Did you happen to notice that? And again, it's in your email folders. You will be able to find it and read it at your convenience, if you would, please. 
So moving on, I think we're now going to move to opponent testimony. And the first opponent I have is Eric Sartorius, Executive Director of the Kansas League of Municipalities. Mr. Sartorius, welcome to the committee. Now we're on. All right. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I am Eric Sartorius, Executive Director of the League of Kansas Municipalities. Happy to be here today offering testimony in opposition to uh, 2518 as it is currently drafted. Um, you've heard this morning and we've heard this uh, recently as well of some residents feeling caught off guard when uh, benefit district was was uh, put into motion as the benefit generally and most frequently a road is enacted or made underway then the cost of the benefit is assessed against the landowners in the benefit district uh, the bill does do a couple of significant things it's it's not just process it does um, <clears throat> change so currently a majority of residents of an area can petition for a benefit district or the uh, an owner with more than half of the area can can petition to create a benefit district uh, HB 2518 would remove that second option um, so that is a significant thing so while that appears to be an, a, an attempt to prevent a single landowner from creating a benefit district uh, it also then would create the reverse situation where solely the potential for a minority of landowners in terms of uh, space footage could petition and, and uh, create a seek to create a benefit district. The biggest point, though, in that change is that doing that prohibits such a petition of a of a single landowner from getting into this process where it is to be considered by the governing body. So, so the legislation kind of cuts out one option of the creation of benefit districts and not even allow that to be part of the, the process. Um, one of the, the real hangups for us in, in section two is that, and this is new as far as we can tell in Kansas statute, it would prohibit an ordinance from taking effect until there was mailed notice given that the ordinance had passed. We can't find anything elsewhere in statute that says that, that an ordinance is not considered valid until it is mailed out. There are some uh, instances where an ordinance, particularly charter ordinances, have to be published in, in a, a publication before they can, can do that. So we don't believe that should be retained. I think it causes a lot of uh, confusion. It causes uneasiness with uh, some bond counsel about whether if a benefit district is created and bonds are to be issued for an improvement, does this leave open a hole that that benefit district could be invalidated down the road while bonds have been issued? Um, in my testimony, I have a little bit of information with respect to some uh, suggested technical changes, just in terms of not every section of the current law requires a hearing. So the, the language should match up so that we're not causing creation of notices being issued for something that doesn't require a, a hearing. Um, and with respect to notice, and, and I uh, believe other conferees may have a little bit more information on this, but if you turn your attention to page four of the bill in section three, in existing law, it says on lines 39 through 41, the seller of the property shall disclose to the buyer that the property is subject to such special assessment or fee or located in an improvement district created pursuant to this statute. So existing law says, and I don't know, you know, these aren't my land deals. These are not the city's land deals. These were lots sold, I assume, uh, by the developer to, to the people who bought either the lot and then built the house or purchased the house on which the lot was built, which again, the seller under current statute is required to disclose these. So I don't know where the miscommunication was there. I don't know how they uh, felt that was missed or not communicated, but that current issue and much of what I've heard discussed today sounds like it's an issue of the seller, potentially, again, I haven't seen those documents or their contracts. There's a question there of whether the seller disclosed to them as the law requires that it was in a benefit district. That, that requirement falls upon the owner of the property 
and not the city. Uh, we do think some of the changes, like this change in section one, that notice be mailed to everybody within the boundaries of a benefit, a proposed benefit district, so before it occurs, we think that makes perfectly good sense so that there is an awareness. Uh, but I think this is, is this kind of a broad out, outlook for, for these things. Uh, benefit districts, as one of the conferees said, is, is not widely used. Um, and in, in visiting with developers and other cities and things, there are a million different ways these are created. In, in some areas of the state, specials, special assessments are a dime a dozen. Everybody knows they're out there. Everybody expects them. In other parts of the state, you talk about a special and folks have no idea what you're talking about because it's never been something used. Uh, so I think there are some opportunities here for better information. Uh, but I think another question for the committee is what's not working in the current requirement of a seller making people aware of these districts that, that is causing a perceived disconnect. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to stand for questions. Okay, Representative Blacks. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, and I can see your point of who you represent with the cities. This is gonna cause some extra work, you know, certainly a couple of mailings and of a public hearing and a notification. I understand that, but we've heard, ha heard some pretty powerful testimony about some uh, really things that popped up that cost a lot of people money. And we had one individual that supported uh, uh, an amendment stating all benefits districts. And it sounds like the issues for roads be eliminated. Uh, where would you be on that? Would that solve some of your problems of mailing? <laughs> yeah, so if, yeah, if you, uh, sure, you know, if, if, uh, uh, if you prohibit somebody from doing something, I guess you don't have to send out letters telling them about it anymore. But I don't think it's necessarily the solution uh, for the perceived problem in this instance. Thank you. Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Eric, I wanted to know how your organization, organization felt about the portion of the bill that make it assessment be part of the real estate contract what is your group about that if not included it would contract be avoidable um i would say we don't we don't certainly don't have a position on page five with respect to the voidable contracts um you know i'd, I'd leave it to you all as to uh whether you want to add the words in to specify that it has to be part of the contract which leads into the seller must already disclose. So that'd be, I guess, an additional place to put it. Uh, you know, you're talking about current law. There's there's room for disclosure already, and you're not sure why that's in here. If you look at this entire bill and just consider the part of putting, making the buyer aware in a contract. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir and that contract voidable if it's not there. That solves a lot of problems real quick. Uh, from an outsider looking in and not somebody in the industry, I would say I would bet that would call some much closer attention to any seller to make sure that they did it. If that's, if that's been a perceived, at least from the testimony we heard, that they felt that their seller who they bought from did not disclose it. Uh, that would be a pretty big hammer. I Others may have different opinions. Okay. I, I just wanted to know if your group was okay with that portion of the bill. We have no actual position on it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the league's position is you're okay with notification, but you don't think that the city should have the obligation to be the ones making the notification. Am I understanding that correctly? Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Sanders. Uh, the, so the existing law says the seller shall disclose to the buyer. We think that's appropriate. But I also would say on the first page of the bill where it adds new language, uh, lines 26 to 28, that uh, any any hearing with, res with a request quest to create a benefit district that uh, a mailing would have to go out to all 
uh, landowners. That would be a new requirement on cities, and we'd be very comfortable adding that in for transparency. But wouldn't it be, or isn't it, the city that's the entity that's collecting the tax? Uh, it's paid through a county assessment. Okay, so would it be appropriate then for the county to be liable to, for this notification piece as well as the seller? Yeah, I guess that's a decision for you all. I, at, at some point, well, that would be my personal opinion, so I probably shouldn't share it. Um, it's been that kind of week for me in front of committees, I'll just be honest. Um, you know, at, at, at some level, and, and I mean, we face this in our own organization, uh, you can send out 1,400 emails in 1,600 different formats and in fonts, and you can send a marching band to somebody's door, and at some point you'll still get told, well, I wasn't told about this. So uh, you all can, can add an additional layer of, of people to notice, notice it up um, and, and see if, if the county sending another piece of mail and the, the city noticing up that uh, there's a request for the benefit district um, adds, adds to, to notice or not. It would be up to you all. I, I'm, I'm at a point with society where I... I scream at the top of my lungs sometimes. I also have a teenager, so I understand the standing in front of somebody and telling them something and still not being heard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Representative Helmer. Mr. Chairman, I may be going way, way back, but um, I like to solve a problem. And so historically, Cherry Creek, and, and he's saying this has been on the market for a long time, so I'm looking at a subsection, and I don't know if I'm going too far back, but mm -hmm. um, typically those are sold and marketed. So is there some way that we can s start solving this by these people are all saying that they weren't notified up front? So is there some way that we can solve this solution and make sure they're notified up front? Yeah, at the front end, I, and I think I'm following with you, like when there's a new subdivision and you might have that model home and there's, you walk through and everything. I guess the, the piece that, that would puzzle me is that the existing law, and, and I'll say I don't know how far, how long ago back this goes, but it says the seller of the property shall disclose to the buyer that the property is subject to a special assessment or fee or located in an improvement district pursuant to this statute. So under existing law, the, the seller of the lot or the seller of the house is supposed to be doing that already. So I don't, and again, I don't know where the disconnect has been between uh, these buyers and either I don't know when they bought, if, it, if at that time, this is going way back into my life, I, I once was with the Johnson County Board of Realtors and Cedar Creek was you know, still development stages and I think they had model homes. So I would think at that point, as people are buying lots and everything, that disclosure should have occurred at that point. And then again, if it's now a 20 year old house, as a gentleman mentioned, and he goes to sell it, he would, under statute, be required to disclose that, that there are specials attached to that house. I would like to see as a good reputation with your organization, maybe you could follow through with the city and the county, that someone could work on that. I, um, I just think it would be a, a good community thing. Well, uh, it sounds like Olathe has been, been reaching out to folks. Uh, you'd be surprised a number of times uh, in this building, people don't like government getting involved in, in private industry and decisions. Just a suggestion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Amix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess the biggest thing that I see here in, um, is that um, uh, Representative Sanders brings up a point about the county being the one that maybe uh, looks at uh, the notification County's not selling the property. I mean, it, the, the seller is the seller. They're responsible 
on filling out the disclosure statements that they have to fill out to be able to sell a piece of property, on and on and on. The big thing that I see here is that uh, um, how, what kind of requirements do we requ put on that seller to notify the, the, the a purchaser of that property or a potential purchaser of that property? That's what this is about. If, if somebody has signed up for a benefit district or is put into a benefit district, when the property was brand new, there should have been notification to that first buyer of that property, second buyer of the same property, and on and on and on. Somehow that's not happening. So whose responsibility is it? I believe it's the seller's responsibility. And it's a simple deal. You go down or you call the register of deeds of the county and you find out what exists on that piece of property. It's a simple deal. You just put it on there. So I think that there are ways of taking care of the problem without bringing another level of government into it, because I can guarantee it somewhere it's going to get lost along the way. So I think that that's what we ought to be looking at. What is the responsibility of the seller? And then should it null and void a contract? Well, if you're giving them notice, probably not. You know, it's just a simple case of notification. If there's somewhere that there's a, a mix up, I guarantee you that there are courts that can settle these kind of issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's my two cents. No, that's and and I appreciate your thoughts. I, the thing that glaring or glares to me, and I didn't really want to get into it at this point, but to me, it's a notification. It's a disclosure thing, and the sellers are failing to do it. I wonder if we don't, and and I don't know if we should discuss it right now, but I'm going to. I, why don't we require on an improvement district that we have to do a notification at the Registered Deeds Office? That way, whenever the abstractor, that way, whenever the title insurance researcher goes to research the title of the property, it's just like any other encumbrance on that property, an easement for the electric line, an easement for the water line. Um, that way, it's picked up right up front at the start of the transaction. The seller or the buyer, rather, looks at the title insurance prior to closing. They've been notified. Um, to me, that's where maybe our failure is, is maybe that we just haven't done a good job in notifying the public. And it's got to outlive the person because uh, I think it's sell five times, you know, and four of those sellers are going to forget to ever notify anybody. They're not going to give that disclosure because maybe simple ignorance. They don't know it's there or it forgot it's there. So anyhow, as we go forward, that might be something we could look at. Um, to me, that's a simple solution. And, that, you know, the city, when they held the hearing, they improved the improvement district. Go to the courthouse and record in the registered deeds office something similar to any other easement or utility right away. So, something to thought, think about, and we can talk to the revisor about that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Amick. You bring up a good point. Uh, Representative Featherston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am agreement that notification seems to be the problem, but I want to clarify because I think we now have in record, you're saying it is the law, the seller must notify of the benefit district. Our earlier testifiers are saying, we do not have said notice. So that seems a problem. Um, is adequate notice considered, like is this sign that was a half mile down the road behind a tree? Is, is the, I just feel like we've created a public record that a law has been perhaps skirted, and um, I just like some clarification. <laughs> okay. Um, You're the guy standing there. I mean, I, I guess the, the, uh, I guess the, the, the addition in line 39 as part of the contract, if you all added that, then it's clear that it couldn't be a sign. And again, not having all the documents of these folks, it sounded like some purchased a home, some purchased lots. Without seeing what those contracts look like, I can't say whether, whether uh, in, in contract and in, in any other disclosures, like a disclosure statement, I can't say whether somebody skirted the law or changed it or what they did. But current law is they were to have notified those folks. Okay, so do you think current law defines notification as a sign placed somewhere in the neighborhood? Uh, I'm, well, in its disclosure or disclose, uh, I'm 
I, I mean, that may be a question for the revisor as to whether disclose and, and maybe for and Jason has uh, wanted to speak to it. There you go. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, I will direct the committee's attention to the second part of the statute, which is at the top of page five of the bill, that the seller of the property shall also obtain a written acknowledgement from the buyer that the buyer is aware of the assessment or fee or that the property is located in an improvement district. So not only must it be disclosed, but the seller must also get a written acknowledgement from the buyer of such disclosure under the current statute. Sounds like the mystery is solved. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, yes, Mr. Denise Chairman. Sanders. Um, so if I could uh, respond to both your remarks and to Representative Amick's remark, I'm, I'm not opposed to relieving the seller of any of his or her responsibility. So you're, you're right in that regard. It just seems to me that the entity collecting the tax should also have an additional obligation to notify a potential buyer. Thank you. Point. Very good point. But you realize the county a lot of times collects the tax, then disperses to the city because the city doesn't have direct taxing authority. It has to be done through the county as they. So then, to Mr. Satori, Satorius's point, um, then it should be the county with the obligation of the notification. All right. Anything else? Eric, thank you so much. Sorry to put thank you, you off. No worries at all. This morning. Uh, I'm trying to stay on task committee. The next uh, opponent testimony we have is Mark Toom, who's the Vice President of Governmental Affairs, Kansas Association of Realtors. Mr. Toom, welcome to committee. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I am Mark Toom. I'm the Vice President uh, of Governmental Affairs with uh, Kansas Association of Realtors. I'm going to talk um, a little bit about one of the remedies, I think, in here, and I think we're, we're agreeable to find a solution to this issue. I think there's certainly room for areas to provide notice up front. I think we're agreeing on that. Um, the concern uh, that we have is, you know, we, we, we sh I sympathize with the homeowner and wanting to have a true cost of a home ownership. That makes sense. Um, and if you look at, you know, our standard uh, real estate contract that we offer, I mean, that's, you know, there's a lot of talk about what happens at closing. There's a lot of documents that are thrown at people. There's a lot of notices dealing with, um, you know, finances and other types of disclosures. And generally, disclosure laws, if you're aware of it, you should disclose it. And in this, in current law, uh, it is a shall. It is a shall disclose to the seller. It does not say that it's in a contract. Um, but our residential real estate contract has a section where it does balance because um, usually they're depending on the time of ownership You may have to pay some of the special assessments and that's credited um, as part of the, the final transaction occurring to when you take ownership uh, so in section uh, 17 which is on page 4 of a 12 page contract you'll see it um, It's checked there, but it's also going to be I would I would find it hard to believe that it wasn't already in the title insurance documents um, that's also it's going to be disclosed there um, but there are certainly things that we can do to improve the disclosure to to that uh, potential homeowner of the true cost of of the um, of owning that home our real problem uh, with the legislation is uh, the uh, dis if it invalidates the contract if it um, is discovered that it wasn't done and that you know what happens if it's years later and who owns you know, that, that just really uh, puts a cloud on the transaction. It's just really not um, advisable at all. Um, so there should certainly be additional disclosures, but invalidating the real estate contract uh, is, not a, is not a good solution. I have an excellent point. And, and, and just for the committee's benefit, everybody realizes the real estate contract is, covers a certain period of time, and it always expires at closing. So it's hard to enforce a contract that's already expired, right? It, it is concluded at the day of, of the real estate closing. So it doesn't live and breathe after that day. Um, and I don't like the, the cancellation part of the real estate contract. That's a myriad of nightmares. Um, and anyhow, committee, any other questions? Yeah, what? Representative Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can't get, let you get away without a question. Right. I mean, just thinking through this, when you buy a house and you go through um, closing and you sign all those documents, things kind of get lost in that. So, and I would think that 
this seems to be a real problem with a particular city in Olathe. And I would think that as, as you're selling a house, a real estate agent is selling a house, we're excited about buying this, purchasing this house, and then all of a sudden you tell them, oh, there is a benefit district associated to this property that at some point could be exercised and you'll be paying for a road that could cost you up to $80,000. That probably doesn't do very well for selling that house. It, it probably, it's gonna be an added cost of the ownership of that house. I mean, I think that there, there's a reason why these benefit districts exist. It's a funding mechanism that, I mean, it is a road, it's gonna, it will benefit the area and it's, um, look and feel and ability for emergency vehicles to get into safely. I mean, there are reasons we have that, that financing tool for cities and developers, um, but it will, it'd will it be nice to have that as part of the true cost of the ownership that it's disclosed. And so um, this seems to be particularly a vehicle that's being used in one city. Do you see that being a trend other places where they're using benefit districts this aggressively or and I guess that would be incumbent too on the local officials to make sure that the benefit districts that they're establishing aren't going to weigh heavily on those future homeowners that are gonna be their residents. Sure, I mean, you you want people to be able to afford you know, the houses that they're in there, um, but I don't think that there's any, um, I, I agree with having additional disclosures um, at, be part of it, but um, I think that it, it is still a tool that's a val valuable tool and it's being used in other locations. It's not just Olathe. This is a, you know, a developer's tool um, to bring in subdivisions. Uh, so it, it, it is going to be around. There's any bay mix. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and just for um, uh, Representative Curtis, it like in my community right now, we have a similar situation where we have uh, a benefit district that was established over the last 15 years or uh, old, uh, an arterial street. There it is. I would, it, that notice is the, is the key. They were probably notified. It was probably on the title statement is that is subject to a, uh, special assessment. The real disconnect is when the money starts being assessed, that time frame. Um, and, you know, 12 years does seem to be, a, I'll say, probably a little excessive. Um, but I can see how developers would roll things out. But it was, it was likely on the MLS, um, you know, the system for transactions uh, disclosed there. It was likely disclosed in the title documents. It was likely disclosed in the contract as, as is. Um, so there's a lot of disclosure here, um, but the disconnect really seems to be that that delay um, in that special assessment because there could be two or three different owners. Representative Curtis. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and perhaps just the understanding from the person who's purchasing the property on what that exactly means. Like you're in a benefit district, you may not actually realize what that entails. Yeah, so I... Hopefully I, they're I, using a realtor that can explain those types of things. Hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Toom, and, and just to be clear for the committee's benefit, um, the Special Improvement District is kind of a spurn by the developer himself, but this isn't the only way that special assessments get levied against property because the city, for example, could take the same role that they want to replace that road or build that road. The city could go in with special assessments to the property owners, never having a developer be in the role of an improvement district, correct? I'm I believe that's true. I'll I think Eric would agree with this. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a way that local government can also special assess so that they can build infrastructure improvements, develop neighborhoods. It's not particularly a developer involved, just simply the municipality. But it's still a special assessment, which is a tax on top of your real estate taxes for that public benefit. So, okay. Mr. Tim, thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony. Well, committee, any other discussion on that? I will. I, I was going to give you a heads up that I'd like to work it next Wednesday, but I think I'm going to let this one set for a couple of weeks. I know a couple of members had mentioned to me they have some amendments that they want to talk about, and, and I'd like to continue this discussion, maybe not in committee time, but feel free to reach out to, to myself or Pam or Doug and if we're going to step forward with this, let's make it as good a bill as we can. And I think we've got the ability to do that. And I think there's some people that could be benefited if we would do the right thing here. 
So I'd like to walk this forward and, and probably look at doing that a couple of weeks from today. Representative Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, Eric, are you working with anybody? I mean, because you said that there were some things that you would like to see amended. Are you working with anybody on potentially amending this? Yes, sir. Yeah, we're, we're in contact with with uh, several of you and working with cities and stand ready and available anytime to, to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, that concludes the hearing on HB 2518. Is there anything else for the committee or for the good of the committee? If not, committee, we are adjourned.